There's nothing I love more than authenticity, which is why I'm so excited about Salsa de la Vida hot sauce, which has been on kitchen tables in Mexico since 1956. It will be available here in the U.S. for purchase later this year. In addition to livening up your food, it's Mexican-owned, it's woman-owned, and it's one of the only hot sauce brands to have 100% Mexican source pepper mix. Salsa de la Vida hot sauce will be available here in the United States to purchase on shelves later this year. Hey there, I'm Leslie Levine Harvell. Welcome to Impolite Conversation, the podcast curated by the Iconoclast Dinner Experience. I believe the best way to explore a topic in depth is to view it through multiple lenses. Join us as we explore race, culture, and societal issues through the lens of industry experts, writers, cultural critics, and HBCU students. We all know that in addition to nourishment, Food is an integral part of culture, celebrations, and simply bringing people together. Restaurants have also served as a litmus for equality and approving grounds for the limits of citizenship. The Negro Motorist Green Book, or what is commonly known today as the Green Book, was first published in 1936 and included most of the United States, parts of Canada, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Bermuda. It was the Jim Crow version of travel and leisure and food and wine. If a restaurant or any establishment was listed in this Black travel Bible, then it was safe for Black people to patronize. As Black people began to make their demands on the state, restaurants became symbolic. Black people in this country were being denied of what should be a universal and unifying experience, which is sitting down at a restaurant and enjoying food. I was watching a recent episode of HBO's Lovecraft Country, and I remember feeling anxious when the main characters walked into a diner in an unfamiliar town on their road trip from Chicago to Massachusetts. That's essentially serving as double duty as research for additions to the Green Book. And I'm thinking, nah fam, it ain't safe. And spoiler alert, it wasn't. But sitting down in a restaurant or demanding food was actually part of a concerted effort to obtain equal treatment in this country. This year marked the 60th anniversary of when four students from North Carolina A&T walked to the Woolworth in downtown Greensboro and sat down at the segregated lunch counter. These students, who eventually became to be known as the Greensboro Four, became the catalyst for Woolworth Company Department store chain, removing its policy of racial segregation in the Southern United States. In addition to serving as sites for demanding justice, Restaurants and food have served as a source of compassion and patriotism to support larger efforts. During World War I, President Hoover and the U.S. Food Administration created the slogan, Food Will Win the War. And it encouraged citizens to curtail their consumption of meat, wheat, fat, and sugar to increase shipments to soldiers. This was encouraged through campaigns such as Meatless Tuesdays and Wheatless Wednesdays. Similarly, during the Civil Rights Movement, there were restaurants that enthusiastically served as meeting places for grassroots organizers, underground supper clubs for protesters, as well as clubs that would sell baked goods to help fund social justice efforts. After decades of organizing, the Civil Rights Movement was the catalyst for landmark legislation such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which ended segregation in public places and banned employment discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act in 68, and it inspired the Immigration Act of 1965, which eliminated the use of national origin quotas. Black power was a revolutionary movement that occurred in the 1960s and 1970s. According to the U.S. National Archives, it emphasized racial pride, economic empowerment, and the creation of political and cultural institutions. During this era, there was a rise in the demand for Black history courses, a greater embrace of African culture, and a spread of raw autistic expression displaying the realities of African Americans. In our previous episodes, Dr. Lok Sui and Dr. Salvador Vidal Ortiz discussed the formation of ethnic studies departments at major universities as a direct result of demands that came from this movement. From 1969 through the early 1970s, 
the Black Panthers Free Breakfast for School Children program fed tens of thousands of hungry children. According to the 2018 article, How the Black Panthers Breakfast Program Both Inspired and Threatened the Government, published by History.com, it was just one facet of a wealth of social programs created by the Black Panther Party, and it helped contribute to the existence of the federal free breakfast programs today. In this two-part episode, we're going to explore how food has supported democracy, specifically through the civil rights movement, the Black Power movement, and we're going to explore how it's supporting Black Lives Matter today. For the first part of our conversation, I'm so excited to chat with Dr. Joanne Hippolyte. Joanne is a museum curator at the National Museum of African American History and Culture with expertise in African American and Afro-Caribbean diaspora material and expressive culture, as well as Black immigrant American communities. She is the curator of the Cultural Expressions inaugural exhibition, which focuses on Black cultural traditions, including food ways. Hi, Joanne. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Leslie. It's a pleasure to be here with you and with all of your listeners. Joanne, I'm a lover of history and culture, and I've always been so fascinated when these things intersect with food. I love food, too, by the way, if you haven't noticed. Leah Chase regularly broke the law by allowing her New Orleans restaurant, Doogie Chase, to be a safe haven for black and white people to meet during the civil rights movement. And Ben's Chili Bowl was a gathering place during the March on Washington in 1963. These are two iconic restaurants, but there were many that supported democratic efforts by way of the civil rights movement, such as Pascal's in Atlanta, the kitchen of Georgia Gilmore, as well as the kitchens and living rooms and basements of the people whose names we don't know. And I'm actually going to place a link to an article that lists them because I really want to honor these names and establishments. But why is studying history through the lens of food so meaningful? And why do you think it's such an indispensable tool in the fight for democracy? I think it's because food and culture identity are so very closely linked. You just mentioned that I specialize in Black immigration identity. And like you, Leslie, I've got Black immigrant American roots. And one of the many ways I could see the differences between myself and other Americans was by the food my family cooked, ate. I'd say that most Americans have cultural associations with foods, which are either regionally or nationally specific, which makes food a really good way to study identity, a good way to study cultural expression, and a good way to study tradition and history. And I'll expand on the little, the last one a little bit more. Obviously, food has historical linkages to place. We can trace the movement of food along with the movement of people around the world and around the country. And we can also trace the encounters of groups of people through food. And you just mentioned Leah Chase. Creole food is a great example of that. And the spices and the ingredients and the cooking methods, you find the French, the Spanish, the Black, Caribbean and Africa as well. But what was going on between all of those groups, right? Who was in power? What defined those interactions? So because we also know the systemic racism and oppression was also global as well, we find that in the food stories that are represented in those spaces as well. I would say that museums have explored food from both sides of the coin. They've looked at it from a cultural aspect, but they've also looked at it in cultural and identity, but they've also looked at it from the oppressive side as well. If you go visit kitchen spaces and historic homes, right, or historic plantations, that can give you insight into the lives of the domestic servants employed there, right? And curators across this generation now beginning to interpret those kinds of lives and providing people with that information instead of just that of the rich family that owned the home. Another great example of the way that I think that food intersects with oppressive conditions is this exhibition I saw at the Chopin Museum in Amsterdam last year called Bitter Chocolate which was about the child labor practices actually associated in Ghana and the Ivory Coast with harvesting chocolate. It makes you think twice about the kind of brands of chocolate you eat and you order from the store these days. The civil rights and Black power movements were about demanding full citizenship for everyone. As it relates to the civil rights movement, one of the demands was the right to vote. But the spirit of these movements was demanding a country that respects human rights and fundamental freedoms. Food, as I mentioned earlier in the episode, is sort of like a basic right. Can you discuss social justice activism around food during the civil rights and Black power movements? 
Yep. I mean, they were definitely friends. And you mentioned a lot of them in your introduction. There were the sit-in movements, obviously, for allowing Black people to have a place at the table. If you think about what was going on with the sit-in movements, right, they were part of larger desegregation efforts around things like public facilities, transportation, and of course, places to eat. Jim Crow laws and codes around restaurants and lunch counters were implemented so that white diners would not have to sit next to or eat close to Black people. And to do so would have implied that Black people were their social and even their economic equals in a society and a system heavily invested in white supremacy. So there are the sit-in movements that are associated with food, but then there are also the planning and the strategizing, as you mentioned before, that happens in all of the restaurants. And we can talk about which restaurants later if you wanna go into more detail, but obviously these are spaces that help fuel the movement, right? Fuel it in different ways. You're actually sustaining yourself by taking in food, which fuels your ability to go out there and be able to continue the good work of marching and protesting and really the traumatic work that's happening during that period of time. And then there are other programs like the Black Panthers program that you mentioned, the Breakfast Program, which are about addressing other aspects of oppression for African-Americans. And that's the economic mobility as well as food insecurity, right? The fact that Black neighborhoods are chronically underserviced when it comes to supermarkets and the fact that they don't have adequate access to nutritious and quality food goods, particularly in the urban areas. That's right. Can you share, and by the way, I love the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I mean, I spent probably like three hours alone in the basement. I would love for you to share some specific artifacts and stories that the museum has on display or in its collections related to the intersection of food and the civil rights movement, as well as the Black Power movement. We do take a really deep dive, I'd say, into the Greensboro lunch counter sit-ins, and that's because it was the first one, right? It happened in February 1st, 1960, and it launched all these other movements around the country. We do so in like four different ways around the museum. We actually have in our Defending Freedom, Defining Freedom, the Era of Segregation exhibition, and that's downstairs in our history galleries. We actually have one of the Woolworths lunch counter stools on display. It's a really great artifact that allows visitors to imagine what it must have been like to be a college student at that time and sit down in one of those seats and make history. It was donated to us by the International Civil Rights Center and Museum. So that museum is actually located where the old store was at the time. It's now a museum that describes that history. The actual lunch counter itself is also across the street from us at the National Museum of American History. Our founding director, and who's now the current secretary of the Smithsonian, Lonnie Bunch, he worked on collecting that item back in the 1990s when he worked for the National Museum of American History long before our own museum existed. Another way the Greensboro sit-in figures in is that we have this digital interactive. It's a lunch counter, digital actor interactive. So you sit down on this long lunch counter, there are many seats, a good 10 people can sit down and participate. When you look down, you're given this digital menu and it's a menu of the movements. You can choose what parts of the movements you want to go into, whether that's the sit-ins or the freedom rides or the boycotts. And the idea is to give you a sense of the fact that aspects of these movements were often highly organized. And many of the people who participated received training on how to conduct themselves throughout the process. You're going to learn about that training and you're going to get questions on what you would do in those situations based on what you know or don't know about how to comport yourself during those situations. There is also a photo mural in the museum cafe. Have you eaten in our cafe, Leslie? Many times. Well, then you're aware of the Greensboro Lunch Cow sitting in the back of the cafe itself. And it's an actual image of the four young men from North Carolina A&T who started the sit-ins. It's huge. Their heads are way bigger than anyone standing. You can see their faces, which are turned towards the photographer, but also they're turned towards us, right? The diners who are sitting in that room or the people who are passing through. So you can't help but think of how far we've come as you're in that space with diners from all over the country and the world. Even Washington, D.C. didn't fully desegregate eating establishments until the 1950s. So northern cities weren't decades ahead of the South with this kind of activism either. And then one other thing I'll mention is we also have a photo of the Black Panthers distributing food at a free lunch program in Philadelphia. Just a little more about that. The great thing about having that kind of a photo on display rather than the typical photo of the Black Panthers marching or with the Black Power Fist is that there's this huge public misperception, right, that Black Panthers were only a militant organization, but they were about ending all forms of oppression for Black people, including things like food security. So they organized breakfast and lunch programs in over 30 cities across the United States, including Philadelphia and Oakland. 
as you said in your intro, they were way ahead of the curve. They were doing this way before the federal funding kicked in to do the same thing. And then I know you said that there were some restaurants that you can touch on. Would you be able to touch on one of those restaurants? I know that people know about Dookie Chase and obviously Ben's Chili Bowl, but maybe can you touch on some of the lesser known underground supper clubs and restaurants that supported? As you said, there are dozens of spaces, right? Let's talk up a little bit about why there are so many spaces. It's important to remember that the movement was all over, right? It was in the South. The people leading the movement were all over the South and the Midwest and the Northeast, and they were there doing trainings. They were there actually doing protesting. They were there attending school. And once the movement kicked off, it spread fairly widely all the way around the country. So there were reasons for civil rights leaders to be all over the United States, whether they were with SNCC or with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference or with other uh, organizations that developed as a part of that time. I'll mention the Florida Avenue Grill, since you didn't. Uh, Florida Avenue Grill is here in Washington, D.C. I don't know if you've eaten it before, but it's a soul food restaurant that started here in the 1940s. And it's been in continuous operation since the 1940s. And it bills itself as the oldest soul food restaurant in the world, actually. And maybe I haven't done the checking, but a lot of soul food restaurants as a result of desegregation and urban flight ended up going away after the civil rights movement happened. But they're still in continuous operation. They have a booth. When you can sit down in one, you walk into it and it's a booth and it has a little marker on it and it will tell you that Martin Luther King sat here and ate while he was planning and meeting in Washington, D.C. And there are spots like that, like you said, all over the United States, talking about Ralph Abernathy or John Lewis. You mentioned Pascal's in Atlanta, right? And I think the great thing about Pascal's and Dookie Chase's is that they had these private rooms where these meetings were held. So you weren't just going to walk in and stumble upon Martin Luther King. They were... These spaces in Pascal's, it was this private space in the back, and in Dookie Chase's, it was upstairs. And I understand from Leah Chase's daughter that they're actually renovating that space upstairs right now while they're closed under COVID. The idea is that they needed to be able to talk privately about what was going on. They couldn't have that information being leaked out there. They were already being wiretapped by the <laughs> by the CIA and the FBI. And so that's important too, the sort of privacy that you needed as, as part of that space. Jim Shahan talks about barbecue joints all over the country and uh, as also being spaces where this kind of thing was created. They were, like you said, people who greeted people and brought them in their homes and took care of them when they were visiting. There were people who created sandwiches for people who were jailed so that they would have quality food and sent them to the jail so they would something to eat. There was a, a large outpouring among the community in any ways that they could to try to help, as I mentioned before, sort of fuel the movement with food. I want to shift a little bit. While not all Southern food is considered soul food, all soul food is definitely Southern. Where does the moniker soul food come from? It comes from the 1960s, that period of time that we're talking about right now. And, you know, it was being applied to a lot of different things, right? The 1960s was a period of time when Black people were expressing racial pride and heritage in all forms. So whether that was art or music or clothing, It was the time period of Afros and dashikis and songs like I'm Black and I'm Proud and slogans like, right? You know what I'm going to say, right? Black is beautiful, (laughs) right? (laughs) So this is this profound moment because Black culture, identity, and all of our natural features have been denigrated and stereotyped for hundreds of years and, and done so systemically in mass media and forms of popular entertainment. So Black people wanted a way and a name for their food as well. And this is food that they had made a huge contribution in developing in the United States, Southern food. So they wanted to claim that as their own, and rightfully so, when you consider who was doing most of the cooking in the country up until then. And the term soul food captured that better than Southern food. You started to see it come out in the late 60s, around 1967 in books. And that's also when you start to see the first soul food cookbooks being published in 1968 and 1969 using the name. Soul itself, of course, is the major signifier for Black culture. People have all sorts of different explanations for what they think it means. But for me, it's like this major signifier for the roots of Black culture, that those deep, deep roots. Okay, so this is a bit of a non sequitur. But in previous episodes, we chatted about coded language, such as the term ethnic and how it's used selectively and it centers whiteness, framing it as the default, as the normative position, while everyone else is racialized. We're in a time where we are more intentional about our word choices. And obviously, words do evolve. How do you feel about the use of the term soul food today? 
do you think it should be called American food or Southern food? Or as a historian, do you think it's important to retain the name soul food? Soul food really captures something, right? It captures a moment. It captures a sense of identity. I don't ever think that we can get away from, in my, in my mind, that it's a good idea to get away from the term soul food. We just need to broaden our definition <laughs> of what it is, right? There's a lot of diversity in soul food. Southern people are regionally diverse. So the food being eaten by Black people in Louisiana would have been different from the food being eaten by Black people in Virginia. And when Southern food migrated north and west with the Great Migration, other innovations developed as well. So you had people in New York putting their little spin on soul food, right? They would have used different greens. And then I think a really good example comes from historian Frederick Douglass Opie. He talks about in one of his books about tamales being served in soul food restaurants alongside smoked sausages. And why was that? That was happening because there was a soul food restaurant in Jackson, Mississippi, where a Mexican man had married an African-American woman and they fused their two food cultures, right? That's what happens with food. In my exhibition in the museum, Cultural Expressions, we included a photo of a Caribbean American restaurant selling both Caribbean and soul food to make the same point. You know, where different people and places come together, you actually see the impact on the food culture. So we need to allow the definition of soul food to expand and to become wider than what we actually think it is. There are historians that I want to give their opinion as well, who suggest that it's a bad idea to just limit Black people to soul food, that Black people were in everybody's kitchen, right? They were in Northern homes, they were in Southern plantations, they were on chuck wagons in the West, and they were cooking everybody's food, whether that was Hercules in George Washington's home cooking French cuisine, or James Hemming is often well known for cooking in Thomas Jefferson's home, or whether it was, you know, someone on a chuck wagon. We were helping to create that cuisine at the same time that it's being developed and shaped in the United States. So why don't you have the ability to claim that kind of food as well? Black people have that ability as well. So they've had a strong hand in all kinds of American cuisine. And when you only limit it to soul food, you sort of take attention away from those contributions as well. Yeah, there are no easy answers. Also, you make a good point that soul food was a term that was internally coined versus being named by an external group. And we do need to allow definitions to evolve and expand. It's the reason why if you come into our museum cafe, you were given these four different stations to be able to go and eat at, right? The West, the agricultural South, right? The Creole Coast. You're given this variety so that people recognize that Black food has all kinds of iterations. Absolutely. So this is my last question. As you know, this podcast is curated by the Iconoclast Dinner Experience. It's your last night on earth. Where are you eating? I am eating in my mother's house. Obviously, she's probably the best Haitian cook that I know, and she's never made anything that isn't good. And she does this thing where she cooks like a lot of great Black cooks without any measurements. So what she does, just by throwing a pinch here and a dash there and pulling anything out of the refrigerator and the pantry is really quite amazing. And I'm always impressed by that. And it's something that I completely lack skills in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, I wish I had that particular superpower because I think it is a superpower. Yes, it absolutely is. More impolite conversation in just a moment. HBO's latest documentary, Stockton on My Mind, is the multi-layered story of millennial mayor Michael Tubbs, whose own experience growing up in poverty and violence inspired him to create innovative change in his hometown of Stockton, California. Becoming the city's youngest and first African-American mayor, the film follows Tubbs as he defies expectations and makes efforts to reverse the fortunes of a city known as one of the poorest, most violent, and least literate in the nation. Directed by Emmy winner Mark Levin, stream it now on HBO Max. Visit hbomax.com to sign up for your seven-day free trial. As we continue to explore how food has supported democracy, part two of today's episode will explore this through the lens of Black Lives Matter. Chef Edward Lee is the author of Smoke and Pickles and Buttermilk Graffiti. He is the chef owner of 610 Magnolia and Whiskey Dry in Louisville, Kentucky, and the culinary director of Succotash in National Harbor, Maryland, and in Washington, D.C. He earned an Emmy nomination for his role in the Emmy Award-winning series, The Mind of a Chef. Chef Lee is also the mentor and creative director for programming and the guidance for the Lee Initiative, which aims to create small but impactful programs that impact the next generation of restaurant industry professionals. Hi, Edward. Thanks so much for joining us. 
Thank you for having me. Louisville, Kentucky became part of ground zero for the Black Lives Matter awakening of 2020. Shortly after midnight on March 13th, Breonna Taylor, a 26-year-old EMT and aspiring nurse, was murdered by Louisville Metropolitan Police Officers Miles Cosgrove, Brett Hankinson, and John Mattingly when they shot down Brianna's door as they were executing a no-knock warrant in a narcotics investigation. Brianna didn't receive medical attention until 20 minutes after being shot, and she died in her hallway. Brianna had no criminal record and no drugs were found in her apartment. The warrant targeted another person who lived miles away and had already been detained by the time police entered Brianna's home. Subsequent to Brianna's murder, no-knock warrants have been banned in Louisville, and Brianna's family has been awarded a $12 million settlement from the city of Louisville. The police officers who arrested Brianna have yet to be arrested. Governor Andy Bashir deployed troops to the city of Louisville on May 30th. It was the first time National Guard troops patrolled the streets of Louisville since 1975. On June 1st, David McAtee, a beloved West End barbecue owner, was fatally shot in his kitchen by a member of the National Guard. Edward, in June, after seven years, you closed Milkwood and reopened it as the McAtee Community Kitchen. Can you tell us what your impetus for this was and how the kitchen serves the community? Yeah, so as you eloquently stated, a lot happened in Louisville over the past few months, and, and a lot happened in those times. Listen, I've lived here for almost 20 years. I'm an Asian man who's not from the South. And I moved here and have lived here and had started a family here. I believe that Louisville is a wonderful place and that there are caring, thoughtful people here who want to do right. We have collectively spent the last 10, 15 years trying to make Louisville a better place. These horrific events happened and there's so much national attention brought to Louisville so quickly. I was trying to figure out a way to do something positive for the city, to do something, you know, I, I say I don't have the power to save the city. I don't have the power to bring justice. I'm a chef and a restaurateur. That's my domain, right? I can control that. I can't control anything else. Whatever was under my control, I wanted to try and do something positive about it. I thought, what does Louisville need right now? And it needed something to, to deliver a message that through small actions and, and controllable actions, we can bring a certain level of justice. We can bring a certain level of equity. We can help communities heal. We can just help each other. I have a chef that has been through the Lee Initiative program who's worked with me in the past at some of my restaurants. And she, I was actually right now teaching high school at Iroquois High School, and she developed the culinary program at, at Iroquois High School. Her name is Nikia Rhodes. She's from the Black community, and her students at the high school are young Black men and women who want jobs in the restaurant business, and so they go to public school culinary class. But, you know, those classes can only teach so much. So when I had this idea for turning Milkwood into a community kitchen, I first asked Nikki if she would be interested in taking charge and you know leading this whole thing. It's a, it's a, it's a big project. She took no time in saying yes. I mean, she had, yeah, I think it took an hour, not even, to say yes. This is all amidst the protests and, and everything that's happened. And so then my co-founder and managing director at Lee Initiative is a woman by the name of Lindsay Osasek. So I called her and we said, I think we want to do this. We had talked about doing this, and we were originally going to name it after Brianna Taylor's. And then, you know, David McAtee was murdered. You know, I didn't know him personally. I, I have eaten his barbecue, but I didn't know him personally. But there is a bond, you know, that all chefs have. Chefs that I've never met before in my entire life. If you're a chef, I know what you've been through, and you know what I've been through. And, and I don't care if it's a high-end restaurant, a barbecue joint, a, a middle-of-the-road restaurant. Like, we all share that bond. And it really touched me and hurt me to see a chef go down like that. He had hopes and dreams. You know, he didn't really have a brick and mortar. He was cooking out of parking lot, but he had a dream to open his restaurant. He cared about his community and he fed people all along the way. And we did a big barbecue in his honor at his barbecue place for his family and neighborhood. And we fed about 300 people just about a week after he died. To hear all the stories that people were coming up to me and telling me about David McAtee. You don't get that if you were an asshole. You know what I mean? Like he fed people. 
he wanted to rise up with his community. He really cared about his community. What I want to do is to honor that legacy of his that wanted to be a chef, that fed his community, that used food as compassion. There was a story where this woman was single mom and she was trying to go back to school and feed her kids and she got fired from her job and he wouldn't accept money for her for weeks you know like little things like that if his name can survive in that way and we can continue his mission of feeding the people in his community that he cared about and loved so much it, it doesn't bring him back it doesn't heal and it doesn't change anything it doesn't fix anything but it honors a legacy we're now in month four of the McAtee Kitchen. It's been tough and it's been wild and it's been crazy. And it's been there's so many obstacles and so many things that happen, many of which will never be made public. It's just been incredibly hard. And Nakia has been, you know, she's you know, only 23 and she has taken everything with stride, with poise, with grace, and has risen to every challenge that has been faced. It's been amazing to see her step into this role and just embrace every challenge. And it's been very inspiring for me. So Black Lives Matter is about accountability by the police and an end to over-policing in Black communities and disregard for Black life. But it's, it's not just about that. It's about so many things in which Black lives have not mattered in this country. So in addition to serving as sites for demanding justice, restaurants throughout history They've served as a source of compassion and patriotism to support larger efforts. So, for example, in terms of measurable progress, after decades of organizing, the civil rights movement was a catalyst for landmark legislation such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Fair Housing Act in 68, and it inspired the Immigration Act of 1965. The Black Panthers Free Breakfast Program, it helped to contribute to the existence of free federal breakfast programs. Everything is local. Everyone has their lane. What does measurable progress look like for you? So there's many things, but one of the simplest and easiest ones is Black restaurants in the West End should get equal press and equal number of articles in magazines and newspapers. It highlights their culture, but it also sends a message that this restaurant in this neighborhood belongs in this conversation about all of Louisville. So when we say, here's the 10 best restaurants, and we pick and choose the neighborhoods where we talk about these restaurants and we exclude the West End of Louisville, what we're really saying is you don't belong. You don't belong in Louisville. You're not a part of this conversation. We don't want you in Louisville. They are in the city limits. There's a huge, rich history of the West End. There's everything there. There's so many stories there. There's so much culture there. And it is not by mistake. There is an active, a willful agenda to keep those restaurants out of the papers. Recently, some of that has changed because of the pressures from, from the Black Lives Matter movement, but it feels a little bit like tokenism to me. I wrote very passionately about this in my book. I want to see a chef profile about a Black-owned Louisville restaurant in the same heroic language terms, sympathy, and earnestness that they write about celebrity chefs in Louisville. You don't just write about this restaurant because it's the best damn fried chicken joint in Louisville. No, I want to know who the chef is. You know, a lot of times when they write about Black-owned restaurants or homey restaurants, they write only about the food. It's the best fried chicken in Louisville. It's the best deal you can get. Best dinner under $15 a plate, right? And when they talk about the celebrity chef restaurants, it's about, oh my God, his childhood, his rise to stardom, the struggles that he had, the, oh, the things that he overcame. It's about the person and, and about the food, but more about the person. And when it's a cheap black owned restaurant, it's only about how cheap the food and it's how great a value it is. And you see the difference in what that does. Because part of going to a restaurant is knowing that there's a person behind that kitchen who you trust. There is something very intimate about putting something in your mouth that someone else touched. And if you trust that person, if you believe that person is a hero, if you believe that person is God, then you are much more willing to shell out hundreds of dollars for that meal. And if the article is telling you that this is only good because it's a value at 
$30 a plate, this would not be good. But it's only worth your time and your energy because you're saving money. And that further pressures that chef and that restaurant to keep their prices low so they can't make more money, so they can't charge more prices, so they can't get out of debt, so they can't pay off their loans. If you're right about Shirley May's cafe, you should be writing about Shirley May, not just about how she does a fried chicken special on Friday nights. It should be writing and you should write it in glowing terms and you should tell her story so everyone can feel and understand and know her. Make her a celebrity. Why do we get to choose who gets to be the celebrity? This is my big issue with media. I don't fault the chefs. Because if someone comes at you and says, hey, I'm going to write a five-page profile in a magazine, who's going to say no? I don't know who to blame. Because even I've heard from my food writer friends who say to me, I try. I have tried to profile that chef in that restaurant. My editors won't let me. And then the editors say, well, this paper is owned by a big corporation. If we do that, we'll lose funding. You know, I, I, I don't know where the buck ends with that. But I do know that at some point, someone has to say, hey, enough bullshit. She deserves a five-page print profile in a prominent newspaper magazine. And not just the three famous black chefs that we all know and love in America. I got a list of soul food restaurants all through the South. The woman that's been running this place for 27 years, who's been putting her heart and soul into it, who is the true torchbearer of Southern food in America. There are plenty of them out there. And, and they don't, you know, if, and if they do, it's like a sidebar column or it's a little bit. They don't get the heroic five page profile. And that is something measurable and easy to do. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. This is something actionable that writers can do, editors can do, and these media outlets that are putting up black squares. You know, let's let's talk about more than putting up black squares. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Thank you for letting me vent. <laughs> oh, listen, this call called Impolite Conversation. Okay. I figured, I figured with that name I could say anything. It's important to have these conversations about neighborhoods like the West End of Louisville. I want to thank you for the work that you're doing. And those things are cumulative. So I appreciate you. And I have one last question. It's an easy one. As you know, the podcast is curated by the Iconoclast Dinner Experience, and it's your last night on earth. Where are you eating? I'm eating at home with my wife. Well, she's eating a bowl of pasta, and I'm eating a bowl of noodles. And if it's really my last night on earth, I don't really care what I'm eating. I'm, I just want to spend it with my wife. Amazing. And then is the pasta cooked by you? Yes. As well as the noodles? Yes. I love my wife dearly, but I'm, I'm the better cook. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Impolite Conversation, the podcast curated by the Iconoclast Dinner Experience. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Icon Dinner and on the Iconoclast Dinner Experience Facebook page. Let us know what you thought about this episode. Hit us on socials or send us feedback at press at iconoclastdinner.com. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to our podcast. And we'd also love it if you rated and reviewed us. 